Hello, this is the craft lecture for unit two, and it's about nine guidelines for effective writing. Language, like the brain itself, is infinitely complex. Any given idea that you can articulate in English or any other language can conceivably be reworded in millions of different ways. Each of these different possible expressions may communicate the same basic message, but the way the message comes across will acquire new shades of meaning and novel rhetorical overtones in each case. Taken as an, as an example, one of the most famous sentences in the English language, to be or not to be, that is the question. Hamlet could express the same basic idea in any number of other ways. The question is whether to be or not to be. Is it better to exist or not to exist? That's a big question. One question that I have, possibly the question, can be summed up in six simple words, to be or not to be. Question-wise, whether or not to be is a big one. One could go on and on. Shakespeare arrived at his wording based on certain conventions of poetic meter, as well as the dramatic impact he wanted the first words of the soliloquy to evoke. But even in different versions of Shakespeare's play, this line is expressed differently, as in the infamous first quarto, where the line is transcribed as, to be or not to be, I, there's the point. The point for us is that writing even a simple sentence involves hundreds of micro decisions at every level. Decisions not only about what to say, but also about how to say it, how to organize words and phrases, which words to choose, and even how to use punctuation. Ultimately, there is a certain amount of arbitrariness in the final form taken by any individual sentence, and to some extent, language is flexible enough that it doesn't really matter whether I say, the forecast today calls for rain, rain is in the forecast today, the forecast shows rain today, or forecast-wise, it looks like it's going to rain today. At the same time, certain ways of articulating a particular idea are more effective than others. They enhance the clarity and precision of a statement or express a degree of appropriate formality or informality. Professional and academic writing relies on a set of rhetorical conventions known as plain style. As the name indicates, plain style is committed to expressing ideas in the most direct and understandable language possible. While language is too complex for one-size-fits-all rules to apply across the board, the guidelines of plain style can help writers both to express themselves more effectively and to clarify their own ideas for themselves. Cultivating a fluency in plain style takes some of the guesswork out of writing sentences and provides a kind of rhetorical ground state from which writers can feel free to deviate as occasion warrants. 1. Identify the subject toward the beginning of the sentence. Use subject-verb-object order. As mentioned in the previous unit's lecture, English sentences have two main components, the subject, the thing that does something, and the verb, the part of the sentence that says what the subject is or what it does. Many sentences also have a third part, the object, a noun that is acted upon by the subject. The classic English sentence structure is sometimes abbreviated as SVO structure for subject-verb-object, and a good rule of thumb for writers in English is to follow this pattern. The sentence, the dog buried the bone, follows the classic subject-verb-object structure. Now, since English is such a flexible language, it is possible to rephrase this in a different order. The bone was buried by the dog. This flips the subject and the object. The bone, the dog promptly buried. That's object-subject-verb structure. Or we could even go full Yoda, buried the bone the dog did, that's verb, object, subject, or buried the dog did the bone, that's verb, subject, object. And uh, as you can tell from all of these other examples, obviously the subject, verb, object statement is the simplest and easiest to understand of these examples. The dog buried the bone. The thing did something. As sentences get longer and more complex, it becomes increasingly important to use SVO structure as a way of clarifying the sentence's basic elements. Here's a sample sentence. In Act 3 of Shakespeare's play Hamlet, the Prince of Denmark ponders the question of whether it is preferable to be alive or to be dead. This sentence begins with a prepositional phrase that acts as an introductory element and then follows a clear subject, the Prince of Denmark, verb, ponders, object, the question, dot, 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 structure. 
We can preserve the SVO structure by moving the introductory element to the end of the sentence. The Prince of Denmark ponders the question of whether it is preferable to be alive or to be dead in Act 3 of Shakespeare's play Hamlet. In some ways, this version is better, since it puts the subject closer to the beginning of the sentence, but in this case, it also sounds a little clumsy, since it could be read as asking whether it is better to be alive or dead in that act of the play, rather than in general. The rules of English grammar also allow us to move this introductory element into the SVO unit. The Prince of Denmark, in Act 3 of Shakespeare's play Hamlet, ponders the question of whether it is preferable to be alive or to be dead. Or, the Prince of Denmark ponders, in Act 3 of Shakespeare's play Hamlet, whether it is preferable to be alive or to be dead. Either one of these options disrupts the SVO flow, making these sentences less clear. Even greater disruptions can be caused by switching up the SVO order altogether, as in, the question of whether it is better to be alive or to be dead is pondered by the Prince of Denmark in Act 3 of Shakespeare's play Hamlet. Or, even worse, pondering the question of whether it is better to be alive or dead is the Prince of Denmark in Act 3 of Shakespeare's Hamlet. As you can see, tampering with the SVO structure typically obscures a sentence's meaning. Writers who cultivate a clear subject-verb structure can convey complex information in sentences that are straightforward and relatively easy to understand. 2. Place important words either toward the beginning or toward the end of a sentence. Beginnings and endings are critical moments in both the composition of an essay as well as at the sentence level. As we mentioned in the previous unit, essays and paragraphs should always begin by identifying their subject and should end with a remark that provides a sense of closure and completion. The same is true of sentences which, as we said in regard to the previous guideline, should begin with a subject and which ideally should end with a strong word or phrase that contains the oomph of the sentence and possibly propels it forward into the next sentence. Ophelia dies when the branch of a willow tree that she is climbing on snaps, plunging her into a river where she drowns. The first two words of this sentence provide the subject and the verb, and the long pre prepositional phrase that makes up the rest of the sentence ends with a dramatic depiction of Ophelia's cause of death. This sentence has an emotional and informational impact that is diminished when it is rephrased with a weaker ending, as in, Ophelia dies when she drowns because she had been climbing on a willow tree branch that snapped and plunged her into a river or Ophelia dies when she plunges into a river and drowns because she had been climbing on a willow tree branch that snapped. These sentences have the same subject-verb structure, but they are less effective than the original sentence because they don't move toward a climactic final word, depriving them of a sense of momentum and finality. 3. Keep related words together. Closely related to these concerns about how the words of a sentence are organized is another principle practiced by writers of plain style, the practice of phrasing sentences so that closely related elements are syntactically adjacent to one another. So here are a pair of sentences where um, in the good version, the related words are together, they're right next to each other, and in the bad version, the related words, the same related words have been separated by some other sentence element. Uh, in the good sentence, Hamlet noticed Polonius moving behind the tapestry in his mother's bedroom. Bad sentence, Hamlet noticed Polonius, who was behind the tapestry, moving in his mother's bedroom. Good sentence, Hamlet noticed Polonius moving behind the tapestry in his mother's bedroom. That's all one important unit, but it's broken up in this sentence. In his mother's bedroom, Hamlet noticed Polonius moving behind the tapestry. Good version, Hamlet noticed Polonius moving behind the tapestry in his mother's bedroom. Not so good, Hamlet in his mother's bedroom noticed Polonius moving behind the tapestry. A good one is Hamlet noticed Polonius moving behind the tapestry in his mother's bedroom. And uh, not so good, Hamlet noticed Polonius behind the tapestry in his mother's bedroom moving. Or a little bit worse, behind the tapestry in his mother's bedroom, Hamlet noticed Polonius moving. This last sentence is an example of a dangling participle, where the sentence structure makes it unclear who the prepositional phrase is referring to. Is it Hamlet or Polonius behind the tapestry? Dangling participles exemplify the importance of the advice to keep related words in a sentence together. 4. Keep your verbs active. Verbs in English have two voices, the active voice and the passive voice. As you can probably guess, active verbs are verbs that do things, Jesus wept, dogs bury bones, 
Hamlet ponders or notices. Ophelia dies. Passive verbs, on the other hand, are constructions where the subject is sidelined and replaced with a state of being. Weeping was done by Jesus. The bone was buried by the dog. The question is pondered by Hamlet. It was noticed by Hamlet that Polonius was moving behind the tapestry. Death befell Ophelia when her willow branch was snapped and she was plunged into the river. In each of these cases, the directness and dynamism of the first example is watered down by the passive construction. These passive examples require more words to say basically the same thing, and they disrupt the clean SVO structure of these sentences, but just as importantly, they also suggest a background situation deprived of action and agency, a world where things are done, but it is never clearly stated who is doing them. The passive voice has often been accused of being the verbal preference of people who want to avoid responsibility. The child who broke the cookie jar might report innocently that the cookie jar was broken, in the same way that countless politicians have sidestepped responsibility for misdeeds by explaining that mistakes were made. For this reason, commentators often use a moral argument to support their advice to use the active voice whenever possible. The highest morality of plain style writing, however, is clarity and economy, and the passive voice violates these principles by dancing around a direct account of events rather than simply stating what happened and who did what. The passive voice does have important uses, and there is certainly a place for passive constructions, even in plain style, but writers should use it at best sparingly. 5. Put statements in positive form. In the same way that the active voice is preferable to the passive voice because it uses fewer words and is more straightforward, it is also the case that effective sentences in plain style say what happens, the positive form, rather than what doesn't happen, the negative form. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern do not tell Hamlet the truth, that's the negative construction, but the same thing can be said more efficiently and more directly by changing the ne negative construction into a positive one. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern lie to Hamlet. Again, as with the passive voice, negative constructions can come in handy when there is some reason to emphasize the negative formulation. For example, if I were writing a paragraph about the theme of truth in Hamlet, then it would make sense to emphasize the fact that the truth is not what Hamlet is getting from Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. But as a simple expression of what is happening, the positive formulation is both easier to understand and more emphatic. One variant of the negative formulation that should almost always be avoided failing some very specific rhetorical purpose, is the double negative construction, a sentence that says what doesn't not happen. Hamlet is incapable of seeing through Rosencrantz and Guildenstern's lies should simply be Hamlet can see through Rosencrantz and Guildenstern's lies. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are not unaware of Hamlet's fragile mental state should simply be Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are fully aware of Hamlet's fragile mental state. Six, one idea, one sentence. If the paragraph is the chromosome of written communication, the sentence is the gene, the irreducible unit of meaning. Written communication tends to rely on the premise that the form of writing will match the content of writing. If a writer introduces an entirely new topic, a reader should expect to see an entirely new paragraph. If the transition to a new topic is even more pronounced, a reader might expect this transition to be announced by a bigger break a new section introduced with a subhead, or a new chapter. This one-to-one -one correspondence between units of meaning and the form of writing also exists at the subparagraph level, at the level of the sentence, where a sentence contains one complete idea and the transition to a new idea is marked by the beginning of a new sentence. As discussed previously, the concept of a complete idea is somewhat misleading since ideas by their very nature are never complete, and yet, for the sake of rhetorical clarity, writers need to present information in the form of a series of micro-ideas that build together to construct the macro picture. Identifying these micro-ideas involves looking out for the elemental units of meaning that interact to form the big picture, and being attentive to the bridges and joints that connect these different elements. Sentences, as it turns out, are naturally suited to enveloping complete ideas, since their subject-verb formula requires writers to say something about something. If I am writing about Hamlet's madness, there are a series of different subjects that need to be addressed. His relationship with Ophelia, the grief about the loss of his father, his ambivalence about being a prince, the things he says, the things that we know about his background, the character's relationship with other madmen in Shakespeare's plays, and to the historical figure on whom the character is based, etc. Each of these subjects calls out for a verb to complete it. 
Each subject clamors to have something said about it, and that statement will take the form of a sentence. Moreover, as is the way with sentences, a certain statement will inevitably introduce new subjects, which then become the occasion for more follow-up sentences. This formula works best when writers try to match one idea with one sentence. Um, so here's a sentence that is probably too complex, too many ideas going on, going on at the same time. Hamlet's meeting with the ghost of his murdered father is one of the play's most riveting scenes, and it constitutes a turning point in the play, most importantly by confirming Hamlet's worst fears about his uncle's character. This is a perfectly acceptable sentence. It is not a run-on in the technical sense of using an ungrammatical comma splice, but it is a run-on in the more general sense of simply con containing more information than a reader can reasonably absorb in a unified cognitive act. This is unfortunate for readers, because it may require them to read the sentence more than once to extract its full meaning, but it is also unfortunate for the writer, since a number of interesting subjects, which could conceivably bud off into their own insightful sentences, are instead thrown away in passing. It would be rewarding for the writer to tease out the various ideas that are clumped together in this sentence. What makes the ghost scene so riveting? What are the major ways that the scene acts as a turning point in the play? What are Hamlet's worst fears about his uncle's character, and how are they confirmed? Turning each of these subjects into their own sentences would make this passage easier for readers to understand, and it would provide the writer with opportunity to grapple more precisely with the scene under discussion. So here's the um, run-on sentence, and then the sentence is broken down into three subunits, but each of these subunits could become the first sentences of paragraphs that could expand on the ideas contained in the original run-on sentence. Number seven, use the rule of three. Advanced writers know that three is the magic number. Genies grant you three wishes, the Christian God is a trinity, three geometrical points describe a plane or support a stool, photographic composition relies on a rule of thirds, there are three little piggies, three blind mice, three wise men, etc. On the level of the essay, we know that the holy trinity of rhetorical structure is the introduction, the body, and the conclusion. In argumentative essays, we are all familiar with the idea that three arguments support a position, in the same way that three legs support a stool. One thing is just an arbitrary gesture, two things inevitably reflect one another and get lost in a mirror game. When you get to four or more things, it becomes difficult to hold them all in your mind at the same time. Three is the model for completeness that doesn't spill over, that expresses a kind of internal harmony and balance. The same is true at the sentence level as well. Not only does the three-part structure of subject-verb-object control the overall composition of a sentence, but writers can often make their sentences more rhetorically satisfying by employing three-part formulations. The cl classic example of the three-part formulation is the classic argumentative thesis statement. So, for example, here's a thesis statement for a whole essay about Hamlet. The development of Hamlet's character takes place in three major stages, from his early melancholy to his frantic madness in the middle of the play, and concluding with the fatalistic resignation he expresses in the play's final act. This kind of sentence takes one idea, the development of Hamlet's character, and spins it off into three ideas, giving the writer a full agenda of points to make in the body of the essay for which this statement is a thesis. At the same time, the sentence itself has a satisfying rhythm, carrying the reader confidently through the twists and turns of Hamlet's dramatic journey. The same principle of the rule of three can also apply for the ordinary workaday sentences that inhabit the middle of body paragraphs. Sometimes a division of three can act as a mini thesis statement, setting up a minor point that the writer will follow with in the next few sentences. Other times, a three-part formulation simply sounds good to the ear and helps to round out the rhythm of a sentence. So here's a two-part sentence. Gertrude begs Hamlet to be reasonable and to accept the reality of death. It's a good sentence as far as it goes, but it also feels like it's missing something. The two things that Gertrude begs Hamlet to do fall short of giving this thought the full treatment it deserves. So here's a three-part version. Gertrude begs Hamlet to be reasonable, to embrace life, and to accept the reality of death. Or, Gertrude begs Hamlet to accept the reality of death, to bless her new marriage, and to embrace Claudius as the rightful king of Denmark. Both of these sentences provide a broader picture of Gertrude's desires and motivations, and they also employ a three-part structure that makes them feel more complete than the two-part version. 8. Avoid redundancy. The rule of three, however, should never be implemented at the expense of a more important rule, the imperative to avoid redundancy. 
Redundancy is obviously anathema to concise and effective writing. If I say Hamlet is sad, it doesn't add anything but word count to say Hamlet is sad, melancholy, and depressed. This last sentence is not even really an authentic use of the rule of three, since though it uses three different words, they are all basically synonymous and therefore collapsible into a single statement. If I diversify the adjectives, I can parse the statement out into a three-part expression. For example, I might say, Hamlet is sad, but also stimulated and even exhilarated by the circumstances that surround him. This sentence replaces the repetition of the three synonyms for sad with surprising and even counterintuitive adjectives that open up new possibilities for discussion and analysis. There are actually two kinds of redundancy, good redundancy and bad redundancy. Good redundancy is baked into the formula of professional writing. The introduction says what you are going to say, the body paragraphs say what you're saying, and the conclusion reviews your thesis and main points. This may sound like saying the same thing three times, but if it is done well, this formula helps to remind the reader and the writer what the main point of an essay is and how all the different pieces fit together into a unified whole. Good redundancy is a critical tool for effective communication. Bad redundancy is when writers repeat themselves in a way that distracts from the main message of an essay, annoying readers by telling us something again that was just said, either in the previous sentence or even a couple of paragraphs ago. Bad redundancy is sometimes an accident. Writers may forget that they already made a particular point in a previous paragraph, but more often it's the result of ineffective planning on the part of the writer. When you're putting ideas together, it's perfectly natural that a particular idea might attach itself to two different things you say in your essay. Outlining an essay helps you see in advance where these ideas want to go and can allow you to play around with the structure so that the ideas that go together are all organized into the same or adjacent paragraphs, helping you to avoid having to resort to phrases like, as I mentioned three paragraphs ago. The key to avoiding bad redundancy, therefore, is pre-planning and especially outlining. Number nine, use sentences that are breathing length. After Hamlet excoriates his mother for conspiring to kill her husband and marry her brother-in-law, Gertrude vows, untruthfully as it turns out, that she won't rat him out to the king. If words be made of breath, she says, and breath of life, I have no life to breathe what thou hast said to me. Gertrude may not be a very good wife or mother, but she does have a way with words, and her syllogism here reflects the truth that language, even written communication, is inherently rooted in the biophysics of the human respiratory organs. It's interesting from an evolutionary point of view that the human capacity for speech has developed as a modification of the apparatus for breathing. Animals have had lungs since they first crawled out of the sea to inhabit land, but it is only with the addition of vocal cords, thin flaps of skin on the inside of the trachea, that the bellows mechanism of the lungs can become the bagpipe-like noises of the human voice. Cultural evolution has continued this trend, building the mechanics of written language onto the breath-based rhythms of organic vocalization. As a result, although there is no rule for how long or short a sentence should be, sentences tend to sound right when they are breath length. For the same reason, commas and other forms of punctuation share a close relationship with patterns of breathing. Once in a while, an unusually short sentence can communicate a sense of impact and immediacy. At other times, an unusually long sentence might help a writer to itemize an extended series of points in a way that rhetorically signifies a mood of excess. In general, however, if your sentences are much longer or shorter than what you can read over the duration of a single exhalation, the breathing length guideline can be a helpful rule of thumb for figuring out where to end a sentence and start a new one. One idea, one breath, one sentence. There is no magic formula for writing a sentence. The specific form any individual sentence takes depends on the rhetorical context, the audience, the communicative style of the writer, and a large dose of random chance. You may have noticed sentences in this very lecture that deviate from the advice presented in these guidelines. Internalizing these guidelines of plain style, however, can help you find your footing in any given sentence by prioritizing the values of clarity and concision. They also come in handy when you are proofreading and revising an essay, offering suggestions for how to reword awkward or confusing sentences, how to divide up sentences that go on too long, and how to streamline excessively wordy passages in your writing. Once you master these guidelines, you will no longer have to ask the question, to be or not to be an advanced writer. The answer will be obvious and emphatic. To be!